Now, there you are. Dear Rector, dear members of the board, esteemed colleagues, let me congratulate you on the 44th anniversary of Maastricht University. And let me thank you for the honor of addressing you here in this very beautiful place and on this very special occasion. Leadership is important. People turn to leaders for advice and guidance. Many people, uh, we follow our leaders in times of crisis and disasters. And many people aspire to be a leader. We buy books about the seven habits of famous leaders. We follow courses on leadership skills. And those who are leaders feel a great responsibility. They need coaches and mentors, counselors and therapists, and a bonus from time to time. Leadership is big business. The study of leadership is traditionally the domain of psychology and management science. It is a blossoming field worldwide. Last year alone, over 4,000 entries in the psychological and economic sciences dealt with leadership. This is an average of 10 new entries each day. And with each new entry, we know more about leaders and leadership. We know better how leaders make their organizations excel, how they can best motivate their team, why leaders make poor decisions, and how leaders should be compensated. An outsider to this scientific literature may be overwhelmed, not only by its sheer volume, but also by its diversity. Consider, for example, the different forms of leadership that scientists have identified. Transactional leadership and transformational leadership. Charismatic leadership, strategic leadership, visionary leadership, ethical leadership, e-leadership, empathic leadership, and last but not least, academic leadership. An outsider to the field of leadership may not see the forest for the trees. Which leadership style to choose? What leadership habit really matters? Which leadership skills make the difference? Can you train those skills? Does intelligence matter? And experience? Are females better leaders than their male companions? How much should you pay a leader? What, in fact, is a leader? Today, I will not answer any of these questions. I will not even address academic leadership. Not because it is unimportant or irrelevant, but rather because I like to ask a different question one that oftentimes gets ignored. The question I'm asking today is, what is leadership for? What are the core functions leaders fulfill? In other words, when do we need leaders and why? Leaders exist by virtue of groups of people who follow. Groups, are, groups of followers are the conditio sine qua non of leadership. Without groups, leaders have nothing to lead. Without groups, leadership is moot. A group is a collection of individuals, typically three or more, who share a common fate. This means that what happens to one member affects the other members of the group, and what one member decides affects the other members of the group, and vice versa. Groups are collectives, in which individual and joint decisions shape the future of both the individual and the collective. Groups that fit this operational definition include prehistoric bands of hunter-gatherers, extended families living in tribal communities, small groups of friends on a joint outing, military squads, sports teams, work teams, the board of an organization, even a terrorist cell is a group. As this list illustrates, humans like being in a group. We live in groups, we raise offspring in groups, we produce and share resources such as food and knowledge in groups, we travel in groups, and we play in groups. And we have done so since the earliest days of our evolution, roughly 200,000 years ago. Group living is a relative constant throughout human evolution, which suggests it may come with substantial survival functionality. Indeed, for the most part of human history, being excluded from a group was lethal. Individuals need groups to survive. But survival functionality is not the only reason for our fondness of groups. 
Together, individuals can achieve more than they could ever achieve alone. By pulling together physical energy, skills and insights, humans can create and maintain wealth and well-being at a level that is unsurpassed in the animal kingdom. And this cannot be better illustrated by our gathering here today in this beautiful building with its wireless technology, all of us so nicely dressed and immersing ourselves in cultural traditions that date back centuries. Without groups, humans would not have survived throughout the past 200,000 years. And without groups, we would not have countries and hospitals, cars and railroads, scientific discoveries and enlightened students. Without groups, this very university would not have been initiated, built and survived governmental budget cuts and massive cybercrime. Without research and teaching units, administrative support groups, policy and project teams, this university would not have made it to its 44th Dies Natalis. And yet, living and working in groups isn't easy. A lot can go wrong. Some countries flourish and others collapse. Some countries prosper and others go bankrupt. Some research laboratories produce series of scientific breakthroughs and many never do. Things can go wrong because of two key challenges that every group faces, today and in our deep past. A problem of motivation and a problem of coordination. We can understand this well in terms of economic games. And let me start with the problem of motivation. Imagine two faculty members, Alice and Bianca, each of them having a choice between working on their own project or on a joint project they started some time ago. Each of them makes the choice to work on what independently and without consulting each other. As you can see, Alice finds it most rewarding to work on her own project, especially when Bianca works on the joint project. The same applies to Bianca. Working on her own project is most rewarding, especially when Alice works on the joint project. The problem now is that if both Alice and Bianca decide to work on their own project, they earn less, both personally and together, than when they both had worked on their joint project instead. Working on personal rather than joint projects in this case is what we call a motivation failure. Economic theory specifies that motivation failures emerge when either Alice or Bianca tries to maximize her personal rewards by free riding on the other team member. Motivation failures also emerge because Alice and Bianca distrust each other. They fear that the other will free ride. And in case of distrust, it is safer to work on your own project instead. When working together, Alice and Bianca face another problem, how to coordinate their activities. And this again can be illustrated with another economic game. Bianca and Alice have to choose between teaching and research. Again, they make their choice independently and without consulting each other. If they both choose the same task, whether teaching or research, they are happier than when they choose different tasks. And a coordination problem emerges when they do choose these different tasks. They coordinate well when they choose the same task. Psychological theory specifies that these kind of coordination problems emerge when group members communicate poorly and when they lack clear conventions and rules to focus on. Most groups face problems of motivation and coordination simultaneously and over time. We examined this in a game where four villagers face the shared problem of flooding. When the flood comes in, all four villagers will lose their house. The villagers can solve this problem individually by building a wall around their house. If they succeed in time, their house is safe. The villagers can also solve this problem together by building a wall around the entire village. If they succeed in time, their house is safe too. Each villager now knows, now needs to decide whether to contribute bricks to the wall the problem of motivation, and whether to contribute bricks to his personal wall or to the collective, the problem of coordination. And here you may see what happens. 
and to be sure these are real people. The two key group challenges modeled in these economic games are omnipresent and inherent to groups. Whenever and wherever people work in groups, sooner or later they face the problem of motivation, how much to contribute, and the problem of coordination, what to contribute to. Failures to adequately solve these problems create group conflict and group dissolution. Solving these problems of motivation and coordination enables groups to, serve, to perform, to outcompete their rivals, and to serve their members' well-being and welfare. And precisely because groups face motivation and coordination failures, they turn to leaders. The primordial function of leadership is to help groups with their problems of motivation and coordination. And having identified these two core functions of leadership, we can now ask how leaders can do that. How can leaders help their groups in preventing motivation and coordination failures? To help groups with motivation failures, leaders can set a norm for cooperation and implement such a norm by punishing free riders and rewarding cooperators. Many studies, our own included, have shown that leaders indeed do punish free riders, that when they do, group cooperation increases, and a large meta-analysis of organizational work teams showed that even work teams in which that work teams are even more effective when their leader punishes free riders rather than rewards cooperators. Punishing free riders and inducing a norm of cooperation can be done with the carrot and the stick, as in these experiments. It can be done also through many other means, including verbal reprimands and compliments, gossip, giving or withholding benefits, through the assignment of nice or nasty tasks, and so on and so forth. Regardless its precise form, however, punishing free riders helps groups because group members tempted to free ride think twice, fearful of being punished. Vice versa, members who worry that others may free ride can relax, knowing that their leader shields them against being exploited. To help groups with coordination failures, leaders could set targets and direction. Indeed, Leading by example solves the problem of coordination because it tells group members what to do and, how and where to go. In our own work, for example, we found that leading by example improved group coordination and, therefore, the ability to outperform outgroup rivals. And as with punishing free riding, leading by example can be done through many different means. Leaders can give a visionary speech or draft a mission statement, they can give direct orders or literally take the lead and show followers what to do and how. Again, regardless of its specific form, leading by example solves problems of coordination because group members know now what to do and when. I have identified the core functions of leadership, helping groups avoid motivation and coordination failures. And I have shown that motivation failures can be avoided by punishing free riding, and rewarding cooperation. And that coordination failures can be avoided by setting target and giving direction, by leading by example. I already gave examples of the different forms that punishment and leading by example can take. And this brings me back to the many different types of leaders and leadership styles the literature identified, including transactional and transformational leaders, strategic and charismatic leaders, or daring and ethical leaders. All these different styles are little more than different ways of performing the very same functions that leaders fulfill, helping groups with problems of motivation and coordination. Now, does form matter? And this is my last question for today. Underlying many of the leadership styles and types that I have mentioned is a classic distinction be between more autocratic and more participatory form of leading groups. In more autocratic form, the leader single-handedly decides on punishments and rewards and dictates group targets. An autocratic leader solves the problem of motivation that Alice and Bianca faced by punishing those who chose to work on their own project. She would solve the problem of coordination by stating that research is more important than teaching. And now Alice and Bianca both know what to do and how. 
In a more participatory form, the leader consults with group members and gives room for dissenting views when sanctioning free riding and setting group targets. She could call a team meeting to solicit the different preferences Alice and Bianca have for working alone or together and for working on research or on teaching. Disagreements and misunderstandings would be discussed until clarity and commitment is reached. And both Alice and Bianca are motivated to work on their joint project and to focus on research instead of teaching. As much as the autocratic form, also a participatory leader solves these workers' problems of motivation and coordination. Autocratic and participatory forms are different means to fulfill the very same functions. And yet, there may be reason to assume that the participatory form works better. With Michelle Gelfand and colleagues, we interviewed over 850 employees in 150 branches of a large bank in the United States. We asked these employees about their unit leaders' autocratic and participatory strategies, about their individual well-being, and their unit's cohesiveness. From the bank's archives, we obtained data on each branch customer service quality. We find that participatory leadership associated with a more collaborative culture, with stronger cohesion, higher employee well-being. Autocratic leadership, in contrast, was associated with a more competitive culture, weaker cohesion, and reduced employee well-being. Although participatory forms of leadership create more viable groups and organizations, our results pertain to the here and now. Another study by Costanza and colleagues rescued this issue using a mixture of historiometric measurement and industry survival modeling. The authors collected predictor data about the collaborative leadership style of organizations from articles published in Forbes magazine around 1930. They then related this measure to the likelihood of organizational survival up to 2015. On average, organizations in their database existed for almost 80 years. At the closing of their study in 2014, 15 of the or original 94 organizations still existed. Furthermore, collaborative leadership predicted the time that elapsed but until death. For every one unit increase in collaborative leadership, organizations were 55% less likely to die. Let me conclude. Groups do not need leaders unless they run into problems of motivation and coordination. They cannot solve themselves. Groups want leaders to combat free riding and to motivate cooperation. And groups want leaders to help them coordinate on some target that is acceptable to most, if not all, group members. Groups allow their leaders to punish free riders and to lead by example. And when leaders do so, groups benefit and with that, individuals as well. The form in which leaders fulfill their functions can be more autocratic or more participatory. Both forms work. Participatory leadership seems to work better. Now, some of you may not be surprised about these conclusions, finding them fitting intuition and introspection. Some of you may find these conclusions helpful in seeing the forest for the trees again. Some of you may be happy to see that one's aversion of autocratic leadership is scientifically grounded. But some of you may question the generality of these conclusions. If participatory leadership provides greater functionality to groups with motivation and coordination failures, why then are domineering, strong, and autocratic leaders so often elected, supported, and rewarded? One answer is that any leader may be better than no leader at all. After all, groups want a leader to solve their problems. If these problems are imminent and complex, Groups may accept any solution, autocratic bullies included. Another answer is that groups sometimes want their leader to be autocratic. When my house is on fire, I do not want the commander to engage in a collaborative consultation about possible firefighting strategies. When my daughter is in the emergency operating room, 
I do not want the medical team to get into some lengthy discussion about the latest science on anesthesia. In these cases, I want action and the commander and chief surgeon to lead as autocratic as they can. In times of crisis and threat, when swift action is needed and clear direction desirable, we demand, support and follow autocratic leaders and doing so is functional to group survival and prosperity. What form leadership takes must and will depend on the functions these leaders are asked to fulfill. Leaders can solve group problems of motivation and coordination in an autocratic way through transformational leadership by being visionary or ethical, by being empathic or participatory. What form they choose matters less than what functions they should fulfill. Leading by example helps little when groups face motivation failures. Punishing free riders is useless when the group faces coordination failures. Form follows function. The science and practice of leadership is concerned with whether leaders are born or built, or what leadership courses and bonus schemes work best. We teach some leaders to be more directive and others to consult before acting. We send some into therapy and suggest to others that they read a book on leadership habits. We often forget to think about the functions leaders have when leading groups of people. When we lead a university, a research lab, a medical emergency unit, or a cybersecurity team, we need to realize that we lead a group. The function of leadership is to help groups solve their problems of motivation and coordination. The rest, form included, is commentary. And I thank you for your attention.